just occurred to me that uh, I talked to the other folks in the committee you know, that uh, I've never seen anyone really talk about the Baker community, you know, in terms of its history and stuff. And um, I figured we ought to do something like that. So uh, that's what, our, what we're doing here today. It's, we're calling a partial history of Bakers in Silicon Valley. And, um, you know, I, I know it's true of some of the people here, too, is that there's a lot of us who came to this area. We were born and raised in other places, but we came here because of our interest in technology, because we liked to take it apart, we tried to put them together again, you know, um, and we were interested in technology and the way it works. It's kind of like the, the technology backup for, for a lot of folks in the U.S. and uh, around the world. Um, what we've got here is a, uh, I think, a really interesting uh, community of people who've been outstanding pioneers and leaders uh, in, in the people of the community and of people doing things themselves and of uh, citizens embracing technology. Um, but before I forget, I know there's a few of your flyers here. There apparently is a new, speaking of this, there's a new maker space opening here. There's some flyers over there, and the maker coordinator is back there, right? Don. So, Don. Yeah. My name is Don. It's called Maker Nexus. We're on Caribbean Drive in Sunnyvale, and we have a grand opening on Saturday, October 26th. So you're all welcome to come. It's a full maker shop with. Uh, Laser printers, uh, laser cutters, 3D printers, full wood shop, metal shop, shop bots, workbenches, textiles, all kinds of fun all kinds of like classes yeah. for kids and adults. And help. We have community rooms if you need to have a meeting like this. We have three rooms that are available, available for free. So we have an off site meeting in this company. It's not profit. And it is not profit. Uh, there's some flyers on it with the rest of all. I'd be very stuff. happy to promote that for you. Okay. I'll oh, yeah. Right. Card. You send me a couple paragraphs, I'll send it out to many people. Thank you. Okay. And maybe ask them for meeting space. <laughs> 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 so, with that, and by the way, that's also in the spirit, I think, of the whole place here is people letting each other know about stuff that's going on. There's been a lot of that history. Uh, we have uh, four uh, folks, I think, that are representing some really interesting aspects of the maker community of, of you know, human technology. You know, Citizen technology, if you will. Uh, Lee Felsenstein is uh, right here. And Lee was one of the founders of the Homebrew Computer Club, of which there were uh, things like Apple Computer uh, uh, spun off from, for example. And, uh, so it was one of the early examples of uh, uh, you know, people building stuff and, and showing their, their, what they built to each other and working together. Uh, we also have Andrew Kawaii. Now, Andrew um, is he's right next to Lee here. He is the current CEO and resurrector of Heathkit. Yeah. Yeah. And so he's going to talk a little bit uh, to us about Heathkit, uh, what they've done in the past, the history, as well as uh, what they're working on now. Uh, we also have on the far end, Dale Dory. Dale um, was uh, founded the Maker Fairs. And, you know, that's how it goes. Make magazine is being resurrected again. Uh, uh, they so um, he's trying to get maker fairs going again. Uh, there's uh, closer. They're going to be happening in other parts of the world. One thing that I think uh, that he mentioned to me is we're not sure if there's going to be a maker fair in Silicon Valley next year. Yep. Yep. So uh, if anybody's got some venue or folks who might help to uh, uh, to help make something like that happen, provide place to do it. They need some money kind of thing to tell them. Um, I'm sure Dale would appreciate that. And then we have Camp PB now. Camp has been involved in the Homebrew Robotics Club, which owes some kind of an allegiance or uh, descendants from the original Homebrew uh, Computer Club. And uh, so he's been involved in that. I can't remember where I mentioned it. was an S S P C. All the, all the yeah. maker events. Yeah. Maker Fair, Robo Games. Yeah. And so he brought some of his robots here. Um, so uh, with that, I don't want to uh, take up much more of your time here. I want these guys to get a chance to talk. So Lee, let me see if I can take your stuff up here first. The title of this talk should be, You Can't Be Serious. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody knows that you have to spend oh, uh, 16 to 18 years in school, study a lot of math, and uh, then go get your degree, your degrees, and now you're ready to start. And then you spend several years learning what you're supposed to know, and on you can go. And then eventually, by the time you die, you may, in fact, be able to work on something that's interesting and important. You know? 
Sorry. Um, a lot of us didn't do that. Uh, I started at age 11 and uh, the Crystal Radio, not at ETA, unfortunately. Um, but uh, in Philadelphia, which was the center of the computer industry, that someone has recently written that it should have been called Vacuum Tube Valley. <laughs> and my instructor in the in an electronics club was an en engineer at Univac, and we did get to, to come in at night and watch him play with the console, not that he could explain it. Uh, and in uh, 1959, uh, my older brother started a computer club in high school, and uh, I was forced to be the chief engineer. Uh, it turns out that the uh, flip flops we were building with the uh, 6S and 7 vacuum tubes worked pretty well. The trouble is, nobody told us that you had to make sure your inputs were clean. And your pulses were not going little, little, little. And so they worked about 50% of the time. Uh, after which point, I, I swore off uh, digital electronics. <laughs> And a little bit of noise there, and you know, the whole thing crashed, so uh, I went on in electro analog for 10 years. Okay. Now, one thing you run into when you're approaching it from that standpoint uh, is that done properly, technical development is fun. I'm not going to change it. Oh, I need to read it to remind myself of that. <laughs> I had as a kid was uh, the history of GE Labs, and they talked about Irving Langmuir, who was the Nobel winning chemist, who was the head of uh, GE Labs. And he would go around and uh, ask the researchers, Are you having fun? And everybody wanted to tell him what their problems were. And he said, No, 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 I don't, I'm not asking that. Are you having fun? Because if you're not having fun, you're not doing your best work. Well, I was encouraged by that. And um, I remember a point in, I was at, at, at Common College in Berkeley at that point during the summer, and um, I got a copy of one of the electronics magazines, and they had this, this uh, solid state class D amplifier in there, audio amplifier, and I said, Could, would I be able to, to lay this circuit out within a three by five footprint? And I began to sit at my uh, table there and uh, work at it, and eventually I sort of came to. Uh, the sun had set, and, and I decided, oh, well, I guess I'd better get up. I started to rise from my chair and found I was stuck to the chair, uh, the leatherette on the uh, seat. Oh, good. <laughs> and uh, that's a situation where uh, you entered the flow state. <laughs> Fortunately, the name of the state is much shorter than the name of the fellow who wrote about it. She, she sent six cents. I call it six cents Mihaly. <laughs> but um, there's a similarity between that and being in the zone in the athletic domain, as I understand. No, I'm no athlete. And more is the pity because apparently when I recently spoke in the uh, St. Petersburg, uh, I heard a talk by a uh, Russian uh, sociologist, I think, who had studied the Akademie uh, Korodok uh, cities. These were the ac academic cities in, in Russia, whole cities of nerds. And <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, the, the Komsomol, the youth, uh, organizations and found out that all of the kids, all of the, the, the geek kids, were heavily into sports. We don't do that here, but that's it's very interesting here because I had, a couple of decades before, I had the sudden realization that I considered myself, you know, having no connection with sports, was actually engaged in sport. It was technological sport. Uh, in which, you know, the, the, uh, you're not doing it for money. Sport is universal. Uh, it even extends to many species of animals. Uh, and 
And so, you know, in professional sports, there's some strange concoction that we've cooked up recently. Um, most of the time, it's just trying to see if you can do what you think you maybe can do, but haven't done. And trying to go for that and, and get it. And to experience virtuosity, you can, if you want, try to gain social uh, points for it. Uh, or it can be done just as an, an, a, a solitary exercise. But it's sport. And I had to realize that I've been doing sport all along. Uh, now, <clears throat> personal computers. Uh, we, we come down to the 1970s or so, actually, by that time. Time sharing had been in operation for a decade. The first time sharing system was developed in, I believe, no, 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 basic was developed in 1965. Time sharing came a bit later, around 1970. And uh, recently I was asked to talk about the connection between time sharing and personal computers. I said, well, there is no connection. Then I thought about it and I realized, no, that's not true at all. In oh. fact, it's a, you know, it, time sharing was a personal computer experience. We just didn't have the hardware to do it on a, one little box. And so, untold numbers of people, I, so if anybody wants to try to make a, an estimate, you're welcome to it. I'd love to know. Uh, had gone through the experience of learning time, on a time sharing system and it, it, interacting with computer on a personal level. <coughs> That, I contend, set up the market for the personal computer. And so when the 8080 microprocessor came out, which was really the first one that had a prayer of being a, quote, computer, unquote. I know I've had an 8008-based system that had been built <coughs> uh, I guess it must have been a professor and graduate students at Sacramento State University. Uh, and this has been eminently displayed. Uh, I was asked about it. I said, look what it took to make it. There's a lot of stuff in there. In 88, a lot of more of that, most of that stuff went inside that chip. So by 1974 or so, there was the chip, and that appeared as the Altair 8800, a very poorly designed, if I may say so, uh, and fortunately poorly designed. We'll get into that in just a second. Um, nominal computer, which has had uh, a lot of empty space in it, two circuit boards, one four slot backplane, but space for three more of these, three, three more such four slots. Uh, and it was uh, advertised as a mini computer for under $400, and a lot of people, you know, the roof fell in when they advertised that. And this is all well known. They I think, estimated maybe they could sell 200 of them and you know, make their money back. And they got, like, the first few days, they got 500 orders. So, uh, the, 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 the rush was on. And because of the fact that you couldn't plug anything into it, uh, you needed a card circuit board to plug the I.O. into it. And no, they weren't making those cards. So everybody who got interested decided, a lot of them decided, well, I can make a card that will plug into it. So these little third party, uh, I sort of tri tripped over that phrase because it's often used in reference to IBM. And this is the other end of the scale. So maybe it's a point of a three party or something. <laughs> 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 and I was involved with one of them. I did some work. Um, computer clubs, of course, uh, appeared at that point because when you bought one of these things, you bought the kit, and you went through all the tribulations of assembling it, you found out you had something to an exercise, I don't know, 35 instructions in machine language, and that's it. I don't think the number's correct, but whatever was built into the uh, 8080, that was what you, you know, were stuck with. But it didn't behave like a time-sharing system. Where's the basic? I want a computer, and that means to me basic. You the Humber Computer Club. 
1975, March 5th, um, a fellow who was uh, actually, uh, his profession would be labeled listed as a uh, radical pacifist, pacifist activist, Fred Moore, <laughs> uh, who had been hanging around the uh, personal computer of the computer underground in Menlo Park, the community computer center for which I called their people's pachinko parlor. <laughs> was a room about the third of one of the size of this room with a number of, a couple of teletypes in it, and kids would come in it for 50 cents an hour, use uh, terminals on a time-sharing service, playing basic program, basic uh, games. And so it helps potlucks and so on. It attracted a, a, a rabid crew of people who uh, came down from Xerox Park and Stanford, artificial intelligence and so forth, just to, to talk about whenever it is we have personal computers, what are they going to be like? Fred hung around and actually was there all day collecting the names and contact information of people who came in the door. And he mailed out to that list an invitation to a computer hobbyist get-together. Because the first Altair to hit the area had Arrived. It was being sent to some of these nascent uh, publications uh, for review, and uh, we had it there in that meeting. We also had someone, Steve Donfrey, who had actually ordered one of those, and had, when the delivery did not happen immediately, he drove down to Albuquerque and <laughs> chatted with them, he's very good at that, and came back to report what was there, what the company was like, and what's going on. Uh, we also had a fellow named Steve Wozniak, who was, had already been designing little terminals, uh, TV typewriters, as they were called. And uh, 30 people were there. And I was there. I was one of the 30. I'm the one who suggested that we just go around the room and talk one at a time about why you're here, what you're interested in, what you've got, if you've got anything, what you need, if you needed something. And so uh, we did that. Uh, we decided to meet every two weeks. And after three, so on the third session, it had grown to the point where it was held in the auditorium of, a, uh, of an alternative school, private school, elementary school. And uh, while one of our number was trying to lecture earnestly on the computer science from the auditorium, half the audience was out in the lobby trying to meet each other. And I said to myself, we've got to bring this process in the meeting, which I was able to do the next meeting because then I was able to take over the running of the meetings and impose my ideas on them, <laughs> uh, at least in terms of structure. Uh, also in the third meeting, uh, Don Pierre, uh, who had by that time received his Altair, brought it in, not telling anyone what to expect, entered a program on the front panel switches, which is the only way you could enter it, uh, and set up a VHF weather radio and said, wait, 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 push the go button, and it began to play Fool on the Hill through the radio from the radio frequency noise that was generated, suitably modulated by the program. And this, to me, was a, a significant event because, number one, there was no money in it, Nobody had asked him to do it. He was showing off, and it worked. And it did something that uh, really nobody had ever done before. It, it, at the end of the score, it then switched into playing Daisy, 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 Daisy which everyone should know. Knew, really, there was the first piece of music ever played on a computer in 1957, but it sure wasn't played through a radio. Okay. Uh, Homebrew Club, we have the, the, the structure of it uh, began it with a, announcements for the newcomers as to what to expect. And then if there was a period when we had a lecture and somebody else was organizing this, and I was just told when I came in, you know, he's going to give a lecture and so forth. <clears throat> and if the person who didn't show up to give a lecture, what I would do from the front was to say, okay, here's the topic of the lecture. Does anyone here know anything about it? <laughs> and what three 
about three hands would go up, and I would call on them in turn, and they would give some fact that they knew, and this would not lose other responses. No, that's not right. Here, this is more nearly right. And on we went, and half an hour, which was the time allocated for the lecture, we were always able to put together as good a lecture as you could have organized. <laughs> Now, it, it helps. This was being held in the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center then, and the center of Silicon Valley. You know, maybe you can't do that just every anywhere. Uh, then we would have the mapping session, and that's where one person at a time would stand up. And when they, they raise their hands, I point to them with a the blackboard pointer, and you've seen that pointer turn up in a number of these TV representations of, of the, the homebrew club. Because all everything else they had to say about it was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> the point was correct. Uh, and uh, I, my rule was stand up when you talk so people can uh, see, identify it. And I almost asked this gentleman, hey, stand up. Well, I'm not my place to do that here. Uh, oh, you want to clock to turn it back on. Oh, automatic systems. Yeah, yeah. And so it needs. Uh, resources, strange and interesting facts, and so forth, anything you wanted to say, except if you wanted to get into the substance of it, I would stop you. And I learned the stagecraft to do that with. Uh, but the whole point is that people could exchange secondary information in that session, so you knew who it was who you wanted to talk to. People would always come up to me afterwards and say, who was it that said this or that? I think in my introduction, I told them, don't do this, because I won't know. Uh, watch and you know, figure out who it is. And then we had the, the random access session. Judging when to call that is, was very interesting. You could tell the room getting more and more tense. So finally, I declare it. Everybody poured it out to the floor and just talked with each other. Uh, the few times that Steve Jobs appeared there, he would stand around with Steve Wozniak, who was there at every meeting, and not say anything. And the first time he was there, I saw him darting frantically about the room with an with a urgent look on his face, trying to listen to every conversation, <laughs> which was worse than possible. <laughs> In 1978, uh, on the third, uh, third anniversary, uh, we counted it up and we found that 37 companies that we could identify that formed out of the uh, homebrew club. Most of them were little tiny companies that come and go on. But then there was Apple and there was InfoWorld, which came out of the uh, Silicon Gulch Gazette that Jim Warren started. Jim Warren was our gossip monger. Uh, there was a lot of the development was going on about tiny basics. So you want a basic, okay, basic is not a simple program. Uh, but there was people there who could find ways to make it simple and small and so forth. And Lee Chen Wang, a uh, physicist, was working at one and developed one, and Tom Pittman was another who had done it. Uh, so this development was going on. We were exchanging and talking about it. Uh, and then, uh, the Altair, Altair, the Mitzmobile, that was in, this was the name of the company, they brought an Altair to town and they showed it around in the, in the Ricky's Hyatt house and other places. Uh, so they had it in an RV. And when they were here, the paper tape with one copy of their basic disappeared. <laughs> you know, no, uh, but no matter number was handed that tape the next day uh, and asked to. Turn, turn out some copies, and he had the high-speed tape duplication equipment. These tapes were then handed out at the next meeting on the ground, bring back more than you can take, because anyone with a teletype ASR could be able to reproduce it. So this was the, uh, the, the theft of Microsoft Basin, uh, which re resulted in a nasty letter to us all uh, by Bill Gates. And uh, we laughed that off because he, one of the things they claimed was we used almost forty thousand dollars worth of computer time. <laughs> yeah, we all knew that was fake. No one ever paid for computer time. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, yeah, 
picked up by someone else. So the effects of which were Microsoft Basic became the standard basic. So then when Fairchild, I believe it was Fairchild, said, we're going to introduce a new microcomputer chip. What's the bad, what's the standard basic? Everybody said Microsoft. And in fact, well, Microsoft got hardly any money from their retail sales. Their wholesale business started at that point, and they did rather well. Um, also, in fact, was the development of Tiny Basic stock because the market had been saturated with Microsoft Basic. And I think that uh, when it came time to introduce Internet Explorer, Bill Gates remembered this. He used the same technique. Okay. You should, by the, by, we shut down the club in 1986. By 84 or sometime, it had become the same old faces in a tiny auditorium. And uh, really, well, the development had moved out as it should have to user groups and beyond. But we had an effect, a significant effect here. Oh, I didn't tell you that in, the, in 1978, the room held 275 people. The mailing list was 3,500 names long. And it made, you probably you really couldn't get on the mailing list unless you went to the meeting. So it had been a tremendous churn meeting through it. So this is a, a, an experience that has had a significant effect. And on we go. Let's talk about more. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Thank you.